Welcome back to System Agnostic Classes again, finally, after a really long time. The following are your usual caveats. These are System Agnostic, which means that they are System Agnostic, so they don't follow any particular system because they are system agnostic. The names are just names, this is how I define these things. If you want to go ahead and define them in a way that makes more sense to you that is different, do go ahead and do that. None of this is about historical accuracy. Most of these classes can be found primarily in secondary worlds, although today I think we will be venturing a lot into low fantasy. And be forewarned, I will try to subvert all of these a tiny little bit at the end of the episode. Hunters are members of civilization. They do not, in fact, live deep in the wilds unless they have a really good reason to. On account of when you live really deep in the wilds, there's no one you can sell your shit to. As a hunter, you go into the forest, you kill animals, and then you bring them back and sell their meat and their bones and their fur and their marrow and whatever else they have to the other people in your town or village or settlement or city. Or do you? Go to the forest, I mean. You definitely kill things and then exchange it for currency or goods and services depending on the kind of economy that you inhabit. But isn't a fisherman also kind of a hunter? I mean, sure, he's using a fishing rod and maybe one of them trident spears as opposed to uh, a bow and arrow and he's using weirs instead of, you know, traps. But aren't weirs really just fish traps? And both hunters and fishermen are often depicted with nets, so that's a, that's a commonality also. Hunters are one of those classes that really needs to adapt to its environment. Depending on whether you hunt in the forest, or at the coast, or in the desert, or in the Rocky Mountains, or on the lava plains, you will have to be able to do very different things. Tracking something across a forest and tracking something across the sand dunes are two very different things. In the forest you have like broken branches and disturbed leaf piles. In the sand dunes you might have straight up footsteps that are still in the sand, but they can disappear quite quickly, so maybe at some point you can't do anything without the help of magic. It's very important for hunters to have varied, self-sufficient skill sets. Even if you live in civilization, you do spend a significant amount of time on your own just outside of it. So you kind of want to be able to tend your own wounds and know some first aid, or you kind of do want to know which plants are edible and so know a little bit of alchemy. But most importantly, you want to know animals and their anatomy. Hunters don't really hunt cows. They're after creatures that will actively and very strongly go to great lengths to resist being killed. And when they're not explicitly tracking one of these things, which can take a while, they have a lot of time on their hands. Sure, you could bring the deer to the butcher, but you could also learn how to butcher deer yourself and be able to sell every individual part of it to the people that need it, cutting out the middleman and making more money. But frankly, aside from the usefulness, hunters don't really sound like great additions to the adventuring party. I mean, sure, survivalists are cool, but really what hunters are are economic actors that function in a solitary fashion. They're usually tied to one place or a very narrow set of places because it's difficult to adapt to new environments. It can be done, but there's really no reason to do it. Unless, of course, you are talking about big game hunters. Where your everyday standard issue hunter hunts boars, big game hunters hunt bears with laser eyes. Storm rhinos, tyrannosaurs, jungle dragons. Big game hunters specialize in tracking and killing these most ultra dangerous of monstrosities and then selling their parts to the highest bidder. The work they do is risky to say the least, but it does come with big rewards and a lot of prestige. You become friends with kings who want to experience the thrill of hunting and killing a roided up elephant that hurls fireballs with its trunk. You collect rare alchemical ingredients for the most powerful of wizards. And above all, you get to travel a lot, because there's only so much big game in any given forest to hunt. You get to be all kinds of hunters. Even on the high seas, you might be hunting a kraken. Of course, realistically speaking, even big game hunters will specialize on certain kinds of creatures and spend a lot of time inside libraries reading about the certain particular individual monstrosities 
monstrosity they're trying to track down and kill. But it is an exciting life full of adventure from which one can maybe eventually retire to a more relaxed version of the job, which is the traditional hunter. The thing that many people seem to forget about rangers is that they are fundamentally a military unit. They are scouts and pioneers who, even when not engaged in war, will be patrolling the wild borderlands of the kingdom or empire. They live in the kinds of areas where the actual border is just a line on paper located in some faraway keep. They probably know the rangers of the bordering empire way better than they do the other military people and their leaders inside of their own. Even if they don't talk much, they will be keeping an eye on each other and tracking their movements. Many people like to conflate rangers and hunters, and while it is true that they have to a certain extent similar skill sets, and rangers do need to be able to hunt for themselves to survive in the wilderness, their reasons for existing are fundamentally different. Rangers essentially work in military intelligence. Because the kinds of people who live deep deep in the wilds and never really talk to anyone unless they have to, aren't usually the kind to swear fealty to like kingdoms and causes. Maybe they do that work on a freelance basis. Maybe their allegiances are always up for grabs. Although a super patriotic ranger who is still an outcast from their society for some reason might be a very interesting character to play. I mean, it goes without saying that rangers like hunters will also be very diverse and adapted to their particular environment. So really what I want to talk about is magic. Anything that allows you to move through difficult terrain quickly or communicate through vast distances, maybe with the help of a spirit animals or something is very powerful. The ability to talk to animals, even if it's just to recruit them as spies, for someone in that line of work is like a Swiss army knife that just contains more Swiss army knives. Shapeshifting would of course also be useful, but I do feel like that maybe kind of steps on the toes of druids. I mean, I do like fluid classes, but when we do have a distinction, I like them to have like distinct iconic abilities, and I do feel that Druids should be the shape-shifting ones, but I mean there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to play a ranger that is also a druid Something that is in between something that is both Although maybe you can come into conflict with the loyalty to your local habitat and the loyalty to the kingdom that claims it Even though rangers are fundamentally seen as solitary I can also really see them as working in teams very well because it turns out and this is true that patrolling vast stretches of wilderness alone is pretty difficult. This is also what makes them so suited to adventuring parties because depending on just how military they are, they might be deployed and redeployed to various different areas, forcing them to have some level of versatility in where they can operate. This, in addition to the fact that their military background makes it so they kind of have to be trained in being able to handle themselves in combat, as opposed to just being kinda good with a bow, makes rangers just into the better hunters. With the exception of big game hunters, of course. Just because you're a good chef doesn't mean you're a good knife fighter, innit? So both hunters and rangers may well have an animal companion. Hunting dogs are incredibly useful for hunting and scouting, and even the most antisocial loner sometimes needs a bit of socialization. The Beastmaster takes that, and only that, and then expands it to a degree where it's really just questionable as to whether or not they need this many animal companions. Beastmasters are essentially circus zookeepers. They have just a whole menagerie of creatures, and probably most of them are not going to be cute doggies and ponies. They'll have acid-spitting bat hounds the size of motorcycles and half-troglodyte owl creatures with claws made of hot steel. A Beastmaster doesn't have to be a skilled survivalist. They may not even spend a lot of time in the wilderness at all, but they will definitely have a lot of academic knowledge on how to take care of creatures, how they function, and how to domesticate them. Like all things, they of course will exist on a spectrum. They might have a very small array of animal companions and just 
travel through the wilderness to study other animals. Or they might have one of them Newt Scamander briefcases that's basically a zoo and travel exclusively to big cities. The point is, with the Beastmaster, the focus of Awesome doesn't just lie on the sapient person character, but also on the creature companions. Which shouldn't stop you from making an interesting character, just to make that clear, but you will also have to spend a lot of time on the creature companions because they will be the star of your show. Depending on the setting, I do believe that players who want to play Beastmaster characters should come up with at least a few of the creatures that they want to control, of course, pending GM approval, just to make them a little more invested in the world. Of course, depending on the system that you play, Beastmasters that control a lot of creatures may be very limited or very overpowered. Like, if you want to have a huge array of creatures that all can fight for you, balancing might force you to make it so they're all pretty shit. And if you want to invest the character points for your creatures in instead, like, a huge war elephant, th that is cool, but aren't you at that point just a knight with a particularly high seat? There is a lot of potential for uh, in-depth mission stuff where the characters have to take care of the creatures more exotic needs like having to place them on a mountaintop every full moon so they can sing a song. But unless you have a party that's sort of built around the Beastmaster, which certainly can be fun, I feel like they will take out a lot of the playtime in any given session with the chores and micromanaging that you have to do. That could work fine, but I do believe that these kinds of characters are best reserved for rules light systems. Of course, you could take an approach that's a lot more focused, which, you know, may not be necessarily immediately recognizable as a Beastmaster, but I do find that, as opposed to the kitchen sink type Beastmaster, there's a lot of flavor here. You could be a Beastmaster that has only arachnids and, like, bugs and stuff. And, you know, that's very convenient for traveling because they don't take up a lot of space. And you can also do a lot of cool poison stuff and espionage. Maybe you work with plants. I know plants are not technically beasts. Maybe they're carnivorous plants. That would be kind of cool. And who's to say that the creatures you control have to be traditionally alive? You could be a beast master of elementals with, like, no magical ability in you. You just know how to control them. Or the undead, for that matter. You don't have to be, like, a necromancer that summons zombies, but you could be able to bind stray zombies and feral vampires and then bends them to your will to do things with them. As badass as he might be, the beefy three-headed dog wrangler does leave a lot of room to be explored. You will not be surprised to hear that all of these professions are a thing in the real world. Hunters, obviously, they still exist because there's a lot of animals that we like to eat that we cannot yet grow on trees like we do chickens and cows. Although there, hunters are often also the herders which is kind of like domestication over a large area, really. I like porting modern concepts into like medieval fantasy, although in this particular case I mean, nomadic people were kind of following and also herding the herd over time, so it kind of existed at the time already. Could also give the hunter an excuse to spend more time in the wilderness. Of course, in the modern world, big game hunters are mostly known as like trophy hunters and poachers, which they're not really looked upon that favorably, and they're a very complex and gray moral issue. Which, I mean, if you play like a modern day setting RPG, considering how murder hobo y a lot of RPG parties get over time, like, I can imagine just killing rhinos and sawing off their horns so that Chinese people can get their placebo dick pills might be right up your moral alley. Rangers, of course, are also something that exists. Every country has elite specialized units that focus on fighting deep in the wilderness. And every kingdom and country and empire and whatever thing that had a military since the dawn of time has had pioneers. Rangers in all kinds of settings would probably be most comfortable using guerrilla tactics in order to make up for their numbers disadvantage, and quite effectively so. I mean, like, most modern and, like, near-future or near-past settings don't focus as much on the wilderness as fantasy settings do. 
But I mean, why shouldn't there be a ranger that specializes in recon and survival in the urban jungle? That would be cool. Maybe instead of climbing, they know parkour. Maybe instead of knowing bird calls, they have cool hacking gadgets. I mean, urban exploration is a thing already. And especially if you play in like the near future and you have huge cities, parts of which are just abandoned. Oh, there is so much potential. Also way better in the near future is the Beastmaster. On account of, like, today, basically, it's a zookeeper. And you're probably gonna need a very specific group of players for them to just be playing a zookeeper. Unless you want to actually go with a circus person. But in the future, you might be able to replace some of your animals with cool high-tech animals, namely drones. You could have big drones, you could have small drones, you could have road drones that drive, you could have flying drones, you could have swimming drones, you could have all kinds of drones. The Beastmaster of the future is a highly versatile technology expert. Maybe you do spying, maybe you put big fuck-off guns on your drones, maybe you control vehicles that are kind of drones. But Burger, aren't you just describing Shadowrun Riggers? Listen, making these videos is hard work, and I would appreciate if you appreciated that a little more, okay? I mean, you can of course still go with, like, creatures and science, because especially when you introduce genetic engineering to the mix, maybe the future, or even potentially the past in, like, deep high fantasy settings, has a lot of interesting stuff to offer. Maybe you actually gene tailor your own individual creatures. I think that would be an interesting kind of zookeeper to play. Thank you very much for watching this installment of uh, uh, interesting classes. No, it's uh, system agnostic classes. Like, comment, subscribe, although I hope that they're interesting. Do all the things, share this to your relevant communities, but do not spam them. Consider supporting me on the Patreon, or the Subscribestar, or purchasing some of my merchandise, or maybe my short story collection. And in that spirit, Maybe, like, get out of the box when you think about doing RPG classes, but not so much that you basically preempt what I'm gonna say in future videos of this series. And see you around, cunts.